Good evening and welcome to the first lecture of our series, Christian Worship, Music and Human Community. I'm happy, honoured and pleased that this partnership between, the, between St Stephen's House and the Royal College of Church Music has come about and that we are co-delivering this series of lectures on worship, music and the human community. We broadcast live from uh, the Curriton Room here at St Stephen's House, the Curriton Room named after our former principal and great liturgical scholar, Arthur Curriton, who was the longest serving principal at St Stephen's House for 26 years, from 1936 to 1962. His chapter in the Penguin Guide to Modern Theology on the Liturgy 1969 is a classic one of the greatest scholars, really, uh, of our college here at St. Stephen's. The room has recently been redeveloped, uh, and we're exhibiting works by a glossop artist, Elaine Howard. She was the Woman of the Year in 2008, and her work, one piece here behind us, focuses on shared humanity. And there is often a religious or spiritual background to her work, in this room, the seven acts of mercy, there is a smaller act, seven acts of mercy depicted on the other wall. Uh, and we see here behind us the feeding of the hungry in an open, approachable, shared humanity way. Like our educational outreach, like this series of lectures in particular, we aim for the meeting places of theology and culture, church and world, clergy and laity, musicians and people who enjoy music, mission and ministry. Ghislaine's paintings in this room inspire this approach and underline the ethos of our teaching and learning. I'm grateful to Hugh Morris from the RSCM uh, for the support and shared vision for our Institute of Sacred Music. Grateful to Professor Bennett Zon from Durham in Music Theology of his inaugural address, which was delivered here in May uh, at St. Stephen's House and is available via our YouTube channel. I'm very grateful to Father Matthew Salisbury, who hosts this series of lectures and teaches on the Common Awards programme, which the uh, ISMO Institute of Sacred Music offers. Please look up the website ismo.sshow.org.uk, uh, the St. Stephen's House uh, Institute of Sacred Music Oxford website, uh, where you'll find out more information about our qualifications, the Common Awards qualifications in worship and liturgical studies, uh, which is uh, available to uh, students, uh, graduates of theology or music discipline with background in theology and liturgy, um, qualifications that are launched this year and uh, taught partly by lecturers and guests of the RSCM. This open lecture series opens that module, which we'll be te teaching uh, on an assessed way uh, in qualification cohorts of this program uh, in the next academic year. And thank you very much to the many guest speakers from the RSCM who have kindly agreed to support this series and the teaching of this module. The recordings will be made available on YouTube, both uh, via St Stephen's House and the RSCM and then shared by email and on social media as soon as possible. Sorry that many of you were unable to join tonight's lecture in person or via Zoom. Um, the recording is uh, available as we will watch this, uh, rewatch it, and we will resend links for next week for the second series, for the second lecture on the 17th of October, Resounding Body, Building Christ-like Church Communities Through Music with Dr. Andy Thomas. And tonight, I'm very grateful that uh, Father Matthew Salisbury is addressing us from the Institute of Sacred Music in Oxford uh, on Christian worship and human community challenges and opportunities. Thank you, Father. Thank, Thank you very much. much. The Catechism of the Catholic Church reminds us that the musical tradition of the Universal Church is a treasure of inestimable value, greater even than that of any other art. Now that might be a controversial statement, but it's quite a helpful one as we begin this uh, series of seminars on Christian worship and music and human community. And 
in the course of uh, this conversation, I'm going to suggest some reasons why we should take music and its connection with worship and community, especially seriously. This sentence from Catechism is the product of seismic change in the approach to music in worship in the 20th century, a union between liturgical action and its musical accompaniment. It's notable that growth, spiritual and numerical in churches, or at least stability, is often to be found where worship, including music, is taken seriously, where it is highly prized. But how else might music nurture the ministry and mission of the church? This seminar series, as an early fruit of the Institute of Sacred Music Oxford, will be exploring this important question. This evening, we will be thinking about some of the statements made about the value of music in the worshipping lives of Christians. These statements have been made over the long 20th century, really from 1903 all the way up to 2007. And we'll also consider some of the many recommendations made by ecclesial bodies, by committees, by commissions over those last 120 years. Why does all of this matter? It is because, to put it simply, in making music well and making music together, we're not just singing our praise and thanksgiving to God, we are bringing it about, we are doing it. We are offering praise and thanksgiving to God in singing, in making music. We are not just proclaiming the kingdom, we are building it step by step, brick by brick, note by note. God is invisible and incomprehensible in the first instance, and music and worship are means of access to rise above our own personal human limitations. In the concluding section, we'll suggest why it is important to act on some of these many recommendations made over the last century and a fifth. The reasons why it is important to act. Singing well and together in unity helps to actualize, to bring about the unity of the people of God. Secondly, singing and song are ways of discovering aspects of our shared humanity. Finally, music in worship that is merely serviceable, but not beautiful or beloved, is not fit for purpose. We must strive for the beautiful and for the beloved. In all the developments over the last 120 years, it is worth highlighting a single point. It is repeated again and again. The music supersedes the other arts because it is an integral part of the liturgy, of the worship of the church. If we accept this, this difference shows that there is something more than a simple bond between music and liturgy. One doesn't just happen in the other. As Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, uh, later Pope Benedict XVI, uh, wrote, music and song are more than an embellishment. They are themselves part of the liturgical action Solemn, sacred music is not therefore a kind of addition that frames worship and makes it more pleasing, but an important means of active participation in worship. I think he uses this term active participation quite consciously. And while it may be associated with the uh, Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy of 1963, Sacro Sanctum Concilium, the first of the 16 documents of Matthew 2 to be promulgated. Active participation as a phrase uh, used in this context has its origin in Traale Solitudini, the instruction on sacred music promulgated in 1903, hence the first, uh, hence the opening uh, date of our long 20th century. It will be the 120th anniversary of the promulgation of this instruction on the 22nd of November of this year. 
allow me to refresh your memory uh, of the text or some of the text of that instruction. Sacred music as an integral part of the solemn liturgy, there, there we are again, Ide Feast, participates in its general aim, which is the glory of God and the sanctification and edification of the faithful. It helps to increase the dignity and splendor of the ecclesiastical ceremonies. And since its principal office is that of dressing with a suitable melody the liturgical text which is being put forward for the understanding of the faithful, thus its own purpose is that of adding greater efficacy to the text itself, so that the faithful in such a way are more easily moved to devotion and better prepared to receive within themselves the fruits of grace which belong to the celebration of the most holy mysteries. The instruction goes on uh, in, uh, in some detail to explain the forms of music in the liturgy which are seen to be uh, most appropriate. And I think these are probably uh, suggestions which we would question or at least um, raise our eyebrow at today. But uh, something that is important that, uh, that the instruction reminds us are that good music shares many characteristics with good liturgy, excellence of form and universality, applicability to the widest possible range of uh, constituencies, backgrounds. The Tralis Cogituri uh, issued some other recommendations which are more practical in nature. The bishops of the Catholic Church were uh, ordered, in fact, to institute in their dioceses special commissions composed of people who are, and I quote, truly competent in sacred music. Uh, and these uh, commissions were to supervise the music performed in churches. They should uh, ensure that the performing forces were well prepared and well educated to carry out their role. But uh, in seminaries and in other church institutions, uh, the diligent cultivation and the affectionate cultivation of Gregorian chant was to be recommended. The uh, formation of choirs in which clerics could sing during their formation, uh, that idea was also promoted. Theological education in general was recommended to include music as an essential and non-negotiable characteristic. The principles and rules of sacred music were to receive as sound a grounding as uh, liturgy and canon law. Uh, Charlie Solicitudini also uh, commended the establishment of new choirs, especially in churches of prominence. Uh, those who would lead those choirs were to be afforded the opportunity for specialist education. <laughs> Higher schools of sacred music, where they existed already, they were to be promoted, supported as much as possible, and new ones were to be founded. The teaching of choir directors and organists and singers was as important as the education of clergy as far as the liturgy was concerned. Many of these Suggestions you will find returning in the successive Roman Catholic documents and also in the three Archbishops' Commissions on Sacred Music, which were uh, which did their work in the 20th century in the Church of England. And I'm sure that there are many other uh, ecclesial bodies which paid close attention to music in a similar way. The next significant document of the Catholic Church uh, in 1947. Uh, was made out or day, which was on, on the subject of the liturgy in general, um, followed by uh, the encyclical Musicae Sacra of 1955, and Pius XII, which is the precursor to the, uh, the better known Musicae Sacra. Again, in made out or day, uh, the importance of plain chant was zealously, was uh, ordered to be zealously promoted, uh, remarking that this has already been done with happy results in not a few places. But it also mentions that chant had an appropriate place in the, uh, in the participation of the people. It was important that the faithful attend worship not as if they were outsiders or mute onlookers, 
but they were invited to fully appreciate the beauty of the liturgy and take part in the ceremonies by singing. Uh, a congregation that is truly present in worship cannot keep silent. So in such a way, the church joins in songs of the, tri the, church, the church triumphant with the choirs of angels. Mayas on Day also observed that uh, modern musical genres were not to be uh, excluded from worship, but uh, they were to be considered rather carefully. Um, a, a triumph of understatement. Um, they write, it cannot be said that modern music and singing should be entirely excluded, but the opportunity uh, that they had to contribute in, in, in some way to the solemnity and the beauty of sacred ceremonies offered the opportunity to lift the mind to higher things. Uh, again, repeated was the suggestion that clerics should be well educated um, and uh, the doctrine, canon law, and pastoral theology are put in the same line as uh, sacred music. This should not uh, be done merely for cultural reasons and to fit the student to perform religious rites in the future, but especially to lead him into closest union with Christ the priest. Turn to the recommendations of Sacrosanctum Concilium, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, which I mentioned before, promulgated in 1963. And it's important to note that there was a remarkable turn in the discourse of Roman Catholic documents at this time that begins to uh, give emphasis to the participation of the whole people of God uh, exercising their common priesthood and the contribution of each individual member of the body of Christ. Uh, the, the value of everyone's contributions uh, was privileged, seemed to be uh, much greater, much greater importance. Again, this is a constitution on liturgy, but it, it doesn't fail to touch on music. The uh, great uh, famous statement that this document makes, the church desires that Christ's faithful when present at this mystery of faith should not be there as strangers or silent spectators. On the contrary, they should take part in the sacred action, conscious of what they are doing, with devotion and full collaboration. So we see again this sense that full collaboration, full participation, and participation knowing what they are doing. To that end, uh, you won't be surprised what comes next. Uh, the study of liturgy was to be a compulsory and major component of study at seminary, and the liturgical and musical formation of clerics was seen as absolutely critical. Uh, the setting up of a liturgical commission in each jurisdiction to advise and guide on liturgy, but also commissions for sacred music and art in every diocese so far as, uh, as possible. If necessary, the three commissions uh, could be fused into a single commission for liturgy, sacred music and art, but they were all to work together and they should be existing in every diocese as far as possible. Sacrosanctum Concilium has uh, special care for sacred music and includes a whole chapter on it. And uh, I commend it to your reading, but uh, I might just point out some of the key ideas. Sacred music, it writes, is to be considered the more holy in proportion as it is more closely connected with the liturgical action. Music is to be considered closely connected with liturgical action, whether it adds delight to prayer, fosters unity of mind, or confers greater solemnity. But the church approves of all forms of uh, true art having the needed qualities and admits them into divine worship. Sacrosanctum Concilium reminds the faithful and their clerics of the importance of choirs, choirs that can sing and can sing well and can be models for others, but also the importance the true value of congregational singing. The whole body of the faithful should be able to contribute that active participation which is rightly theirs whenever the sacred action is to be celebrated with song. Musical education, once again, for clerics and religious, 
the existence or formed foundation of specialist institutes, uh, approach to Gregorian chant. It should be given private place, but other kinds of sacred music are by no means excluded, so long as they accord with the spirit of the liturgical action. Sacros Actum Concilia reminded the faithful that music has value in devotion as well as in worship. Uh, and there were some particular opportunities to be had in devotional acts led by uh, lay people, um, so that in devotions and sacred exercises, uh, participation could be fostered. Sacros Actum Concilia also recognizes that there are different vernacular musics and different traditions in different countries of the world. And due importance was to be accorded to the music of all of these traditions and in adapting worship to the native genius of these traditions. Various instruments were to be admitted alongside the organ, um, especially uh, in, in contexts where uh, they were particularly appropriate uh, for a regional uh, musical tradition. And composers were encouraged to produce works which have proper qualities, that is, uh, providing not only for the needs of small and specialized choirs, but for the participation of the whole assembly of the faithful. Uh, Musicam Sacrum, 1967, the instruction on music in the liturgy of Paul VI. Um, there's an there's a acknowledgement that singing happens in differentiated ways. Uh, choirs sing perhaps more involved uh, music in, in particular contexts in the liturgy and congregational participation happens perhaps in different ways. And both of these uh, both of these routes are very appropriate and worthy. There's much detail in Musica Sacrum about the choice of which parts of the liturgy are to be sung. Uh, generally, those parts of greatest importance. Uh, the canticles uh, at the office and uh, the ordinary and proper of the mass uh, in the celebration of, of the Eucharist. The importance of setting up and indeed sustaining choirs uh, deserves particular mention towards the end of Musica and Sacrum. Uh, the, the establishment or, 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 um, or fostering of, of professional choirs uh, of choirs in seminaries and religious houses of studies, but also choirs to be set up in, in smaller and ordinary parish churches. Uh, even when there is no choir, uh, Musicam Sacram points to the existence or value of a cantor, at least one or two properly trained singers who will present, quote, some simpler musical settings with the people taking part. Uh, the cantor can lead and support the faithful as far as needed. Education, another uh, common feature uh, which we've seen uh, over the last minutes, not only in music, but in liturgical formation as well, for members of the choir. Suitable spiritual and liturgical formation should be given to choir members in such a way that the proper performance of their role will not only enhance the beauty of the celebration, but will bring spiritual benefit to the choir members themselves. And yet again, a reiteration of the importance of clerical formation in music and the value of specialist institutes of sacred music like our own. Uh, once again, repeated the value of dances and commissions for sacred music. Uh, liturgical commissions set up by bishops' conferences with responsibility for sacred music across the piece in their jurisdiction. All of these, uh, all of these uh, suggestions. Uh, come back in uh, succeeding instructions and, and, and constitutions and other, other documents uh, which treat the liturgy and sacred music. Um, I'll summarize them for you later, but we've heard again and again the same sorts of ideas. I wonder why they keep recurring in the documents. Uh, is it perhaps that they haven't had the uh, success that, uh, that might have been desired in all of these areas? I want to turn now to the Church of England, in which we are situated. Uh, there were three Archbishops' Commissions on Church Music throughout the 20th century. That's quite an astonishing thought, really. First, uh, reported in 1922, 
there were serious concerns about the manipulation of human emotions through the use of music in worship, prioritizing music which was which might be described as trivial or tawdry or superficial or inherently poor. The commission preferred music described with foreign terms, dignity, beauty, taste, simplicity, restraint, uh, echoing some of the comments uh, in the various instructions on sacred music which we've just heard. The 1922 commission uh, criticized the use of, quote, the idioms of the opera and the concert room as unacceptable. There should be strong emphasis on the priority of words, the value of unison music, and the value of congregational singing. Each diocese in the Church of England was, uh, it was suggested that each diocese should have an inspector of choirs and a diocesan music committee. And Ordinands were to be properly instructed, quote, in the essentials of liturgical chant. I wonder uh, which ecclesial body uh, they were reading the documents from in 1922. 1951, Archbishop's Commission on Sacred Music. Um, effectively, you can read all the same things uh, through the 1951 report, which prioritizes the words and the, quote, noble language of the Book of Common Prayer. Musical settings were to have qualities of nobility and restraint, free from, quote, sensationalism and mawkishness, and from all suggestions of secularity. They went on saying, it is unwise to offer to young people that which is too intimate, personal, and emotional. Uh, yet, the 51 Commission reflected that the standard of secular music had improved <laughs> since 1922, and that church musicians were rejecting the quote, unreal and conventional. Uh, the 51 Commission also made a parenthetical remark. Uh, criticizing the use of, of professional singers in parish churches. That's quite an interesting reflection, and while it may touch only a few choirs in, in the metropolis and elsewhere, it's an interesting reflection uh, being made in 1951. But the one I really want to spend some time on, because it relates most closely to the situation which we find ourselves in the present, is uh, In Tune with Heaven, the report of the Archbishop's Commission on Church Music, 1992, a considerable term in the language here. Religious music of all kinds, say the commissioners, has an appeal far beyond the membership of the church. The commissioners recognized the value of sacred music as a tool for mission and evangelism and ministry. They reflected that music was experience common to all people and nations, Music is identified variously in the rhythms and tunes of human invention, the songs of birds, the sounds of waters and winds, or even the supposed harmonies of the spheres. Religious belief is not necessary to accept that music is, quote, part of the natural order. It is something that is there to be enjoyed or not as we wish, in the same way as the scent of flowers, the colours of the rocks, the taste of honey, or the warmth of the sun. Quite bold rhetoric. But, they said, if you believe in a divine creator, then the natural order, of course, has its origin in God and is not by chance. Thus, all manifestations of beauty have their origin in God, and all manifestations of beauty have a purpose. If music is a revelation of God, then it expresses something of the mystery, the order and the glory of creation, and reflects very aspects of the divine nature. Music, the commissioners said, is thus used by God, both inside and outside of worship, to speak to us of God's righteousness and mercy, God's power and gentleness, God's mystery and God's love. And it was the responsibility of the church to foster musical gifts, to encourage musicians, and to cultivate sacred music in all its variety. There are interesting paragraphs which I'll leave uh, to you as individual readers to look at on uh, the importance of planning uh, worship and ensuring that you know what's going to happen, uh, a few paragraphs on singing in tongues, and a few paragraphs on liturgical dance. 
um, they carried out a, uh, a survey on the role of music in worship, or that perception of the role of music in worship. Uh, among urban churches, churches in built up areas, one of the most important roles was to promote, quote, corporate awareness and fellowship. Whereas in rural churches, uh, higher priority was given to uh, the idea of uplifting the soul. Uh, various evangelical and central churches thought the role of music in promoting corporate awareness and fellowship was more important than those in those of the Catholic tradition, which gave priority to illuminating and intensifying the words and in helping people to train. In 1992, uh, of the respondents to the questionnaire, uh, the most popular hymn, uh, hymnal was uh, Mission Praise or Junior Praise, used in 36% of churches responding, followed by Ancient Modern New Standard, used by 28%. But between the two, there's quite a, uh, a cornering of the market. Um, the 1992 report also placed a uh, heavy emphasis on the value of active musical participation by the whole congregation. Yet, it wished to uh, note the value of performance by choirs uh, and smaller groups of people, encouraging the employment of special musical skills uh, and allowing those who cannot or do not wish to sing to enjoy and meditate upon what is being done by others. Both claims uh, were part of, of the worshipping congregation. They reflected that the word performance was not necessarily uh, pejorative. Full participation was not properly understood, man speaking or singing by everybody all the time. There was a, a difficulty noted uh, with, with a disparity between cathedrals and well resourced churches, churches with good, well resourced music programs on one hand, and what was seen as a generally low standard music in other churches. Uh, and an open question, how much the better resourced churches help the others? This is something which I think in this century uh, and in this decade and the last decade uh, might now be bearing fruit. There were many, many recommendations. Um, a very great many, I, I haven't got the number. Uh, getting on 50 recommendations at the end of the, of the 92 report. Um, Again, uh, invitation for clergy and musicians to work together to, uh, to give fresh consideration to uh, the place and the value of music in, in worship and to consider the best ways that it might be done. And the idea that uh, clergy and, uh, and musicians should work together and not against one another, taking the opportunities afforded by collaboration that uh, close and amicable working relationships were to be fostered uh, by including musicians doing all in their power. That congregations be given ample opportunity to sing. That new music could be experimented with. And that uh, choirs and music groups be given opportunities in church services to sing and play on their own as well as involving the congregation. And interestingly, that those responsible for choosing the music should be not only guided by uh, the value of the music, but the quality of the doctrinal content, language, and musical idiom. So attention to the words, uh, those unregulated use the words which are uh, used in the context of uh, worship. Um, I'd like to uh, draw your attention to uh, an even more recent report uh, Transforming Worship, Living the New Creation, a report by the Church of England Liturgical Commission in 2007. They use similar language to uh, the 1992 report to describe the universality of the importance of music from a wide range of traditions. Uh, and observe that all those who plan and lead worship need to exercise discernment and understanding in the choice and use of music. Uh, based on what resources and skills are available to them. It's observed that there is an urgent need for a kind of training and formation of both clergy and musicians 
which will help them to develop the necessary collaborative skill and the discernment and understanding to use music effectively in the church's life. Um, there was danger, they observed, that marketability rather than intrinsic worth can inform some of the choices uh, of music presented in worship. Uh, where, and this is a quotation, where churches sit lightly to official liturgical texts, the scriptural and doctrinal depth of what they sing becomes a still more urgent matter. And churches need to work consciously to ensure that the affective and the doctrinal aspects of their hymns and songs are in balance. As I've said, many of the recommendations made by uh, the Church of England reports are on the same few topics. Choosing appropriate forms and styles and variety of music, uh, valuing traditional and heritage forms, but as, as, as well as determining what are appropriate new ones. The 1992 Church of England report uh, says, perhaps churches which don't already have one should consider forming a music group, whether or not a choir was already in existence and ensuring a close relationship with the choir, if it did exist. And uh, I want to point out again, the value of encouraging composers to write for the particular needs and resources of parishes. The need for musical development, fostering achievement in choirs and cantors, as well as uh, clergy and those responsible for leading music. Congregational development, uh, giving congregations the opportunity to learn how to sing well together. Um, and the musical and liturgical formation of ministers, but also musicians and composers. And again, the uh, desire to appoint diocesan diocese music advisors and parishes, to start local training courses for church musicians, to make use of the wonderful example and the resources in cathedrals, to make use of their opportunities for mission and evangelism, and to uh, foster commissions, uh, involve the director of music in a uh, protocol church council business about worship and in general foster a collaborative approach between musicians and the clergy. Interestingly, uh, one of the uh, one of the final recommendations of the 1992 CME report was to encourage uh, church musicians and those who teach music in church schools to agree on a common repertory of hymns and songs. And the wonderful new RSCM initiative, Impact, is doing just that. Um, it's taken, uh, well, since 1992 for, for a, a wonderful organization to discover the, the attraction of, of doing that. And we hope that it's very, very successful indeed. Why must, must it be the responsibility of the church to respond to and to act on some of these highly repetitive recommendations from the Roman Catholic Church and from the Church of England and the bodies uh, which considered sacred music over the last 120 years. Return to what I mentioned earlier, why does all of this matter? It is because in making music well and together, we are not just singing of praise and thanksgiving, we are doing praise and thanksgiving. We are not just proclaiming the kingdom, we are building it. Or singing well and together in unity helps to actualize the unity of the people of God. <coughs> the philosopher Terence Cunier, in a wonderful chapter on the significance of liturgical singing, observes that the form of a work is not incidental to its content, but it deeply shapes the sorts of information that it can express or that we can assimilate. When congregations engage in group singing. They have to become attentive to actions of the other, to respond in appropriate ways to those actions, and to act together for the purpose of actualizing something which they all recognize to be of worth. Junior thinks that these behaviors are examples of what they are being encouraged to pray for. Thus, the performance of the liturgy in song is content instantiated, to use his term. It brings about what it's singing about. To reflect on the work of a different philosopher, uh, James K. Smith, singing and song 
are ways of discovering aspects of who we are and what we share. Singing for Smith is a full-bodied action that activates the whole person. It is a performative affirm, uh, uh, affirming of our embodiment, a marshalling of it for expression. The delights of musical harmony also attest to an aesthetic expression of interdependence and intersubjectivity. And the rigors and pleasures of musical creation attest to our vocation as sub-creators. In short, music and song seem to stand as packed microcosms of what it means to be human. Finally, music and singing offer for Smith a compacted theology. Music and song are incubators for Christian faith. And Smith draws our attention to the heart. Um, this is uh, a member of the body which uh, St. Augustine also reflected on in his commentary on Psalm 32. Augustine uh, writes in that commentary, just as singers of the harvest or the vineyard or some other arduous toil express their rapture to begin with in song set to words, then as if bursting with a joy so full that they cannot give vent to it in set syllables, they drop actual words and break into the free melody of jubilation. Jubilus, a long, wordless melisma, is a melody which conveys the heart is in travail over something it cannot bring forth in words. And to whom does that jubilation rightly ascend? if not to God, the ineffable. This reminds us of what uh, Ratzinger observed. Uh, music that is not beautiful or beloved is not fit for purpose, for, for purpose. Music must be beautiful and beloved. The church, he writes, must not settle down with what is merely comfortable and serviceable at the parish level. She must arouse the voice of the cosmos and elicit the glory of the cosmos itself, making it also glorious, beloved, and beautiful. The church is to transform, improve, humanize the world. But how can she do that at, if at the same time she turns her back on beauty, which is so allied to love? The church must be a place where beauty can be at home. In May, when we celebrated the launch of the Institute of Sacred Music in Oxford, Professor Zon reminded us that if God himself is music, as music theologians often suggest, the creation of this institute is itself, quote, a theological action, and that as such, it is itself a performance of music that continues to create itself. In other words, it is a performance of God's very being. It means a community in harmony with its purpose, with its creator, attuned in the groove, being what it represents in the fullest sense of its creation. The practice of sacred music, I hope you'll agree with me, is performative. It helps the kingdom of God, of which it sings, to break into the world. It's about the singer who turns and listens to the breathing of the person next to them, to uh, to discover when it is that person is going to breathe and so they can breathe together or that, so they can breathe in alternation. It's an opportunity for singers to listen to a wider group of people and to think about how to sing in, in unison together. That is the bringing about of unity and concord, which signals the beginning of the kingdom of God. I want to leave the last couple of words to the liturgical commentator Amalarius of Metz, who talks about cantors at various points. He says, during liturgical reading, the person listening is fed in a certain sense, like an ox. The cantor, on the other hand, is like the plowman who calls out for the oxen to drag the plow more cheerfully. The earth is furrowed as the oxen drag the plough, where the cantors, drawing their innermost breath, drag forth a sweet voice and present it to the people. Through this voice, they go to their own heart, as well as the hearts of others, to tears and to the confession of sins, as if laying bare the hidden parts of the earth. Getting our music right in worship 
is a wonderful opportunity to bring about the unity and peace of the people of God, to instantiate what we're singing about, to begin to bring it into being. Because singing and song are ways of discovering who we are and what we're about. And we're beginning to build the kingdom. In reflecting on the various recommendations issued by these august bodies over the last century and bit, we see how many commonalities they have, how many recommendations are repeated by commission after commission, by committee after committee. And I hope that by sharing some of them with you this evening, um, we've brought them back into the consciousness uh, and that perhaps we will uh, see some ways in which uh, some of these recommendations are being followed. Uh, some exciting and uh, innovative projects happening in churches and cathedrals, schools across this country and around the world. Um, and hopefully uh, in sharing these examples of good practice, we'll be able to reflect together on the connections between Christian worship and music and human community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Father. Uh, and we will take questions um, at the next session when we start again um, uh, and uh, maybe come back to some of the things you've explored with us tonight. Thank you so much for this historical overview and this beautiful lecture this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much.